Lord, rise up, rise up, rise up.
knows my name Yes, he knows my name He knows my name Yes, he knows my name And oh, how he walks with me Yes, oh, how he talks with me And oh, how he tells me That I am his own
That's the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy. Good morning. Happy Easter and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. Would you repeat after me wherever you are and whoever is with you out loud? Will you repeat? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Friends, I welcome you to the First Presbyterian Church, to this gathering of God's people for the celebration of Christ's resurrection from the dead. You know we celebrate that every Sunday because every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is Resurrection Day for Christians all around the world every week. But today, you know, it goes up another level as we actually do mark approximately the day when it was that Jesus rose from the dead victorious over darkness, over sin, and over death. We are here to invite you and invite one another into celebrating this, even in the midst of this complicated and difficult pandemic season. The message of the resurrection breaks through, and we want to share our best understandings of what that means even here and now in this time. I am Jack Haber, lead pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm joined up front with my two colleagues, uh, that is Taylor Hall and Stephen Emick as uh, fellow pastors in this congregation. And we do truly pray that you will be 
touched, you will find a whole new level of hope and expectation for the greatness and the goodness of God. Let us worship together. Friends, it is good to be together this Easter morning. My name is Taylor Hall, and I'm the pastor for Faith, Formation, and Youth. And so before we begin our Easter service, I have a few announcements that I want to make regarding Faith, Formation here at First Presbyterian. Whether you are a longtime member or whether you are joining us this Easter morning, we welcome you and we want to get you connected if you would like to be connected. We have over 20 different Faith, Formation groups that continue to meet virtually over Zoom during this time of social distancing. No matter your age, whether you have children or youth, or whether you, an adult yourself, are looking for a group, we have something for you. If you would like to be connected with a group during this time, feel free to send me an email or give me a call, and we'll make sure that you are connected with a small group during this time. We also have opportunities for devotionals. These are daily devotionals that are catered towards all families of all ages, as well as a new thing that we added this Holy Week, which is devotionals specifically catered to adults. Each of these daily devotionals have a scripture lesson as well as questions to reflect on. The very last thing that we have going on for Faith Formation is every morning on our Facebook page, we are posting a daily prayer service that is led by our pastors and our staff. We welcome you to join with us at any moment whenever you feel like taking a break to do a centering prayer, a scripture lesson, and a reflection led by one of our staff here at First Presbyterian Church. These scripture lessons also come from the daily devotionals to really provide this deep connection throughout the entire life of our church. Again, whether you are a longtime member or whether you are visiting us this Easter Sunday, if you are looking to get connected here at First Presbyterian during this time of social distancing, you have the opportunity to do so. And friends, happy Easter. My name is Stephen Emick. I am the pastor for pastoral care. Glad that you're with us this morning. Let me say a few words about pastoral care. Uh, we have members of our congregation who are standing by that if there are any of you who might need help with some grocery shopping, to have some food delivered to the house, you would like to have somebody just call and check in on you on a regular basis. Reach out and let me know that, and we will be glad to connect you with some members who are just waiting to make that happen. One of the things we started this morning, new uh, in, during this pandemic, a way for us to eat, be even more connected, those celebrations that are happening, birthdays and anniversaries that individuals can't go out and celebrate, and they're not seeing the rest of our family to say congratulations. And so beginning today, uh, prior to worship, on the announcement slides, we are listing all of our church family members who are celebrating birthdays the week ahead, wedding anniversaries. We're also sharing there those concerns, prayer concerns for those in our church family. Uh, so remember that we go live 15 minutes before worship, 9.45 a.m. It gets you logged in, you get to settle in, but you also get to hear and see a whole bunch of things happening uh, joys and concerns in the life of our congregation. As we prepare to gather for worship, we want to reassure you that those of us who are leading worship up front and behind the scenes are taking every precaution we can to honor social distancing and to honor our space. So what you can't see is out there, we have rearranged a lot of our technical equipment that it is spread out in a variety of places in the fellowship hall. No one is next to each other in terms of our tech crew. When we're off camera, we're wearing masks. We have hand sanitizer all around. We're trying to keep our distance up here. So thank you for concerns for us. Know that we are taking this very seriously, and we encourage you to continue to do that as well. Speaking of the crew, we want to give thanks again for those who have come out today, are scattered around the room. Tony Ledbetter is on the crew this morning, along with Tim Benner and Laurel Carney. We're grateful for our musicians, Tom Dressler and Wilson Velasquez and Shannon Ledbetter, who are all gathered to help make this worship that much more meaningful. Happy Easter. Let us worship God. My name is Akwele Masakoi, a member of the First Presbyterian Church of Allentown. The call to worship. Let us read it responsibly. Christ is risen. 
Christ is risen indeed. God is alive. New birth is given. Hope is alive. A new age is dawning. Joy is alive. Redemption is here. Love is alive. Death cannot defeat us. We are alive. New life is within us. The church is alive. God's spirit is within us. God of life, we worship you. God of creation, we praise you. God of revelation, we learn from you. God of resurrection, we come to celebrate you. Friends, on this day of resurrection, we remember that it is through Christ's death and his resurrection that we are brought alive to new life in Christ. We remember that it is in and through the waters of baptism that we are named and claimed and assured of our salvation. And so on this Easter morning, let us confess our sins before Almighty God, confident of Christ's gift of forgiveness. Will you please pray with me the words that you will see? Loving God, we confess that the joy of the resurrection 
has been evading our grasp. We have been gripped by fear and captivated by despair. We have been dwelling in the valley of the shadow of death and not seeing the high peaks of your resurrection life. Please forgive us for missing the glimpses of your goodness, the power of your promises, and the hope of your glory. On this resurrection day, this Easter celebration, please draw our eyes upward. Remind us that in Christ we are more than conquerors, even over fear and death itself. And renew our trust in you, from whom nothing can separate us. In the name of the blessed Savior and the resurrected Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, Christ is risen. The stone is rolled away. The tomb found empty. Mary calls out, I have seen the Lord. We have seen Christ too in every helping hand, in every heartfelt gift, in every choice to restore life in this world. We are called to this new life, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. You are forgiven. Accept your forgiveness and know that God loves you and desires great joy for you and your life. Walk forward on this journey of faith, knowing your brothers and sisters are with you. Friends, in the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Friends, the church has left the building. If you drive by our corner, as most other corners in town, you'll see the parking lot pretty much empty pretty much all the time these days. The last four or five weeks, it's been like that. But oh, the building might be closed. However, the congregation, the life of the congregation is still thriving, serving in all kinds of ways. We, we are burning up the time on Zoom, planning and organizing and arranging the kind of things that you've heard from my fellow pastors early on in the service. And we are doing so much, reaching out beyond our vision, beyond our reach, beyond just one another. For example, the Diacon Adoption and Foster Care Mission Team recently assembled and delivered 40 Easter baskets to Diacon Adoption and Foster Care Ministry. That is a ministry that helps families that are fostering children, kinship families, many of them, that is where some other relatives, uh, maybe grandparents or aunts or uncles, are raising the children that cannot be raised by the ones that originally bore them. Uh, but also foster children of all other kinds, as you well are familiar We've been very engaged with working with them. Some 40 Easter baskets were prepared for them, including toys and games and stuffed animals and art supplies, books, and yes, of course, chocolate and other candies. The Easter baskets were given to the children, the teens under their foster care, and we continue to support that ministry. At the same time, members of the church have prepared meals that could be put together in uh, Ziploc bags and handed out to the homeless. Their housing may not be different than it was before, but oh my, that housing isn't getting supported. And that fallback, uh, that support for them, many organizations have had to shutter their doors. We're continuing to work with whatever organizations we have in the area so that with careful social distancing, we still can be supporting that population. There are folks in all kinds of needs whose ministries we continue to support all around this community and even beyond it into the world. You know that we don't have an offering plate to pass by you where you are. And as a result, the giving isn't quite the same as it normally would be, but it's actually been sustained quite well by those of you who are committed supporters and, and givers to the church. I want to encourage you all uh, in a spirit of thanksgiving to God for the life and gifts that God has given us in Christ through grace, through his resurrection, uh, if, to be giving. You have instructions on the screen with which and by which you can make your 
gifts, your commitments, your tithes and offerings so that the work of the Lord can continue to be sustained. By the way, even our preschool teachers are still are teaching home to the children at home and our DIG program, our children's education program in the Sunday program normally are also continuing to teach our children of all those ages. Support them. We want to continue supporting our and, and funding all of the salaries of our employees, our, our staff, some 30 or 40 uh, on one level or another, please, with your generosity, we can give and support and, and continue to do the mission unabated, unrestrained, so that the work of God would continue to work through us into the world and that God would be glorified in the process. God bless you, my friends. God bless you as you give. God bless you as you receive the great goodness and grace of God. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 5 and 17. A man by the name of Lazarus was sick in the village of Bethany. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. This was the same Mary who later poured perfume on the Lord's head and wiped his feet with her hair. The sister sent a message to the Lord and told him that his good friend Lazarus was sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, his sickness won't end in death. It will bring glory to God and his son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and brother, but he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Now we will go back to Judea. When Jesus got to Bethany, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. The second reading is from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 32 to 45. Mary went to where Jesus was. Then as soon as she saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw that the Mary and the people with her were crying, he was terribly upset and asked, Where have you put his body? They replied, Lord, come and you will see it. Jesus wept, and the people said, See how much he loved Lazarus? Some of the others said, he gives sight to the blind. Why couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still terribly upset. So he went to the tomb, which was a cave with the stone rolled against the entrance. Then he told the people, roll the stone away. But Martha said, Lord, you know that Lazarus has been dead four days, and there will be a bad smell. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you had faith, you would see the glory of God? After the stone had been rolled away, Jesus looked up toward heaven and prayed, Father, I thank you for answering my prayer. I know that you always answer my prayers. But I said this so that the people here would believe you sent me. When Jesus had finished praying, he shouted, Lazarus, come out. The man who had been dead came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of burial cloth, and another cloth covered his face. Jesus then told the people, and saw him and let him go. Many of the people who had come to visit Mary saw the things Jesus did, and they put their faith in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We move into a time with children. So children, those who are tuned in with their families, this moment is for you. I want you to repeat after me. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Children, I hope that you are all having a wonderful Easter with your family. But Easter looks a little different this year, doesn't it? Here at church, we're not physically together. The thousands that normally gather here on Easter morning aren't here. Rather, we're all in our own homes. Some of us might not be wearing our Easter Sunday best, our clothes. Some of us might be missing that moment when our youth choir processes in the sanctuary. There was no Easter egg hunt yesterday here at the church. We also found out this week that we won't be going back to school for the rest of this year, that everything will now be done online. And so maybe we're missing our teachers or our friends and it's okay to miss them. 
And also, for your parents, your parents at this point might be running out of ideas to keep you busy. You know, maybe at this point, there just, there seems to be not enough fun activities or even chores to keep you happy. Now, at some point during this time, you might have felt bored, wishing that you could go outside and play with your friends, your neighbors, those that you love and have fun with. And unfortunately, your parents had to say no. We also know that because of Easter, some of us would be traveling today. We would be traveling to visit our grandparents or our aunts or our uncles or our cousins or other loved ones, and that's not happening either. Even your Easter meal might look different today because right now grocery shopping is an extremely difficult task. Now, even on this Easter Sunday as part of worship, the pastors chose a different scripture to be used that you just heard. Normally on Easter, we talk about the resurrection of Jesus. But instead, we just heard the story of Jesus raising up the dead man, Lazarus. So yeah, Easter is feeling a little different this year. And if any of you have felt differently because of how everything is different, I get it. I'm feeling it too. How many of you have felt bored or sad or angry over the last couple of weeks? I want you to go ahead and share that with your family. You can just say yes. If you've ever felt bored or sad or angry, tell your family. Have you felt those things? For any of you who have ever felt bored or sad or angry over the last few days, let me tell you that those days definitely weren't awesome. Everything's not awesome. Wait, what? I'm so right. Everything's not cool. I am so depressed. Everything's not awesome. Preach, brother. I think I finally get Radiohead. Bro, you should check out Elliot Smith. What's the point? There's no hope. Awesomeness was a pie. No, guys, I, come on. My spirits be at the bottom of the sea. Life's not real. I just want to eat carbs past the ice cream. I'm not a thing you can just use to fill emotional voice with. Stop. Everyone, okay, just listen. Everything's not awesome. Uh, yeah, we know. That's what we're singing about. But it. that doesn't mean that it's hopeless and bleak. How so? Everything's not awesome. But in my heart, I believe. I believe. We can make things better if we stick together. If we stick together. Side by side, you and I can build it together. I first heard that song from the second Lego movie actually as part of a sermon. And ever since I've heard that song, it has been with me everywhere I go, especially now. Everything's not awesome. Mary and Martha are terribly sad over the death of their brother Lazarus. And Jesus is crying too. Everything's not cool. We're isolated from our friends and our family during a time of coronavirus, and everything feels different. I am so depressed. This Easter feels different. But friends, the most important thing is that although this Easter feels different, the Easter message is still the same. The Easter message is not 
that everything will always be awesome? The Easter message is this. The Easter message is God will always give us hope even when things are not awesome. Everything's not awesome, but that doesn't mean it's hopeless or bleak. Everything's not awesome, but in my heart I believe. God will always give us hope. That's the Easter message. Let that message get stuck inside your heart. Friends, will you pray with me? Please repeat after me. God of Easter, Easter. risen Christ, Christ. today feels different, different. and we might feel different. different. Some days will be awesome, And some days won't be awesome. awesome. But the Easter message is still the same. same. You, Jesus, give us hope. hope. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. Friends, we said at the beginning of the service, you said at the beginning of the children's service, sermon or message, that is, I want to say it again responsively. Repeat after me again, wherever you are. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. So how's that working for you? How's that working for you? How's that working for you? That question made famous by Dr. Phil McGraw presses us to face the facts at hand. What are you doing? How's that working for you? What are you believing? How's that working for you? As day has run into day through these past several weeks, it's become increasingly clear to me that on April 12, 2020, I would be preaching the most important Easter sermon I'd ever preached Maybe the most important sermon I'd ever preached on any occasion. As a matter of fact, this could be the most important sermon you have ever heard. That is, if you're open to it and are willing to do hard work along with me. You can't take this one lightly. In order to do this best, I'm setting aside the pulpit. I'm going to pull up a chair. So I can talk not to you, but with you. Well, you welcomed us. You're welcome to be into your living room your family room, or whatever room it is that we're in. And I want to talk eyeball to eyeball with you. In fact, I'd love you to talk back your thoughts to me and your questions to me as I share with you. Uh, you have the, space, the comment space on your screen to write me back. Now, I won't see your notes, your thoughts, while I'm speaking to you, but I'll read them later, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. I do want to talk with you this morning about Christ's resurrection. And how Christ's resurrection can really work for you. And how it, in fact, is the only thing that can work in a time of suffering such as we are experiencing. I want to start by glimpsing into what's going around us. And to do so from the words of some of my own family members who got a jump start on Easter this yesterday. We all got together yesterday morning, about 25 relatives on my side of Barbies and my family. We gathered for a two-hour holiday party mostly from up here in the Northeast, some in the Southwest, some in the Midwest, one over in Korea and another with his girlfriend over in Singapore. It was the wee hours of the night when they were online with us. Think of an Easter dinner with no food in front of us, just smartphones or computer screens. Uh, it was a Zoom room party. Asked to lead our time, I threw out a plan. I said, tell us each one in sequence, alphabetically, of in one sentence one of the highs and in another sentence one of the lows you've experienced in this pandemic season. I introduced everyone as I said alphabetically starting with my sisters Toby's daughter Alyssa and husband Andrew out in Ohio. They started off with the highest of highs as they showed off their three-day-old baby boy their first child. Right then and there, they cast before us a beautiful vision of the hope of new life, a vision we all so terribly needed to see. 
Another high came when Alyssa's older brother, Scott, who was a tutoring business in northern New Jersey, where business is off by 65%, nevertheless shared with us that he is now offering tutoring to the children of all medical workers in the New York metropolitan area free of charge. In fact, they'll even do it outside that area. Moms and dads, if you need some help, I'll let you know. Send me the note and I'll let you know how to get a hold of them. But among the lows were a few reports of relatives who have lost their jobs and been waiting interminably online, online uh, to try to get unemployment benefits. How do you reconcile all this grief with the claims of God's unending love? Well, this isn't the first time followers of Jesus have asked those kinds of questions. It's not the first time followers of Jesus have been flung into the the valley of the shadow of death. 9-11 being the most recent case in point for us Americans. But this is the first time in our American lifetimes in which we all were needing to go to such lengths to try to keep from dying. And it's the first time most of us have shouted, Christ is risen when death has had us cornered. How's that working for you? Well, for Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who watched the stone roll away, it was working for them. And for Peter who ran to the tomb and found the stone rolled away and the tomb empty, it was working for him. And for the many hundreds of others who saw the risen Savior over the next 40 days, it surely was working for them. But he promised he'd be back soon. And so he ascended to heaven, leaving them with bated breath, expecting him to return any day. But he didn't. As days turned into months and years and decades, some came to doubt his promises of return. Some even came to doubt the veracity of the resurrection reports themselves. So the apostles Mark, Matthew, and Luke in sequence wrote accounts of the life of Jesus as well as his death and his resurrection. Other apostles wrote letters to the faithful reassuring and clarifying the truth on the matter. But just about every one of those folks died martyrs' deaths for their efforts. And people's perplexities over death itself continued to provoke doubts about the faith. Finally, the last one remaining, the Apostle John, a very old man now, set out to tell many of the unpublished stories of Jesus' life and ministry. Oh, he wrote, wrote about the same culminating events, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, but he had a head full of stories that the three gospel writers hadn't written about. In particular, the one we heard this morning had also to do with life being resurrected. But in a non-yet-published story, about the death and resurrection, or at least raising and acted by him, not for him. And this took place in the circle of his three best friends outside the circle of the 12 apostles, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. In the story, we see Jesus proclaiming and showcasing the resurrection, but not as the one raised. Again, it's the one doing the raising. It's a long story, so I won't tell it all. But there are three things in that story that I think have lasting meaning for us, and I want to highlight them. The first one is simply that death happens. Death happens. The story takes place in two locations. The town of Bethany, just outside Jerusalem, on the other side of the river, and on the other side of the river Jordan, just past Jericho. Bethany, right next to Jerusalem, and Jericho, Jordan, 16 miles away by the map, but 5,200 feet away in elevation, down to where the walls fell down. And more recently, John the Baptist also used to do his baptizing. It's up in Bethany that the three siblings live, down by the River Jordan, where Jesus on this day is preaching. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that their brother is sick to the point of death. Come quickly, they urge. The perplexing thing about John's account of the story is that when Jesus hears the news of Lazarus' illness, he doesn't panic. He doesn't drop everything and run to go help him like a good EMT would in our day. In fact, Jesus glibly says that, oh, this won't end in death for Lazarus. 
It's for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then he stays there for two whole days. Now, I really wish John had left that part of the story out. It would be a whole lot easier to tell the story. But the fact is, Jesus didn't hurry. Why? I think because he was saying, death happens. Back in the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, we read about the first sin by the first humans. It's told in a matter-of-fact way, as if historical. It should just be just as easily a parable, but what matters is its message and the fact that it explains a lot. Those first humans, Adam and Eve by name, brought death into the human and global story by rebelling against God, choosing to become independent, entrepreneurial, self-directed in every way. God warned them if they reject God's will, they would bring death to the planet. They did. They didn't die immediately physically, but physical death became an inevitability for them, for all other humans that would follow, for all of nature too. And what did happen immediately was that the planet transitioned from a constant life to cycles of life and death. Life and death. And yes, death happens. It happens to plants and animals. It happens to people. Good people and bad people. Old people and young people. Rich people and poor people. Healthy people and sick people. It's the great equalizer. Jesus doesn't keep Lazarus from experiencing it either. He doesn't keep Mary and Martha from witnessing it. And Jesus doesn't panic. He doesn't panic when it happens. But Jesus does respond to it. After continuing to minister by the River Jordan for two more days, Jesus does tell the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to awaken him. Well, that was a polite, understated way of saying that Lazarus was dead. They didn't get it, so he finally said, Lazarus is dead. We're going to go take care of that. So they went up that 15-mile long mountain climb, on their steep, windy, difficult dirt pathway. And then they arrived. And Jesus did something remarkable. He cried. Jesus weeps. And in the process, he shows that our dying breaks the heart of God. That's the second thing I want you to see in this story. Our dying breaks the heart of God. Jesus arrives into Bethany. And as so, the word gets to his sisters of his nearness. Martha breaks out in a sprint to get to him. Lazarus has now been entombed four days. Not just dead, but cold and smelly. And it says so. She scolds Jesus for his tardiness. Mary then shows up, and she also scolds Jesus. What does Jesus do? The shortest verse in all of the Bible says, Jesus wept. Actually, that... Short verses sandwiched between two others that say he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. That's the English typical translation. Literally, the original language says he was troubled inside and loudly groaned. Oh! Then he wept. And then when taken to the tomb and hearing all the others crying, all the more he was greatly disturbed and troubled inside and loudly groaned again. He felt, he expressed, he demonstrated the full range of human agony in the light of human suffering. As the prophet Isaiah wrote of him centuries before, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He did not diminish our pain. He did not say, oh, heaven needs another star. It doesn't. He did not say, stuff happens. He wept and groaned in anguish. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with our grief and pain, sharing and bearing it to the point of tears, heaving in anguish, groaning in agony. As God and the person of Jesus doesn't explain our pain, He shares it. Yes, hear this. God doesn't, through Jesus, explain our pain. He simply shares it. He feels it. He lives it. About 20 years ago, when I was called upon 
to lead the funeral service of a church member who a day before had been my, in my office, but since then had been brutally murdered. I dared in that funeral sermon to ask, where was God when Judy was dying? Where was God when Judy was dying? The answer I gave was that God was in the same place that God was when his own son was dying. God was weeping, heaving in anguish, crying out as Jesus was crying out. God was not eliminating the pain, but God was feeling every bit of it as his own. Yes, Jesus weeps. And in the process, he's showing us that when death happens, we need to weep. We must never allow ourselves to lose the compassion, the empathy, the pain, minimize the sadness, overlook the horror, and even the anger that must happen in response to the seemingly irrational and injustice parts of it. In the case of Lazarus' death, though, the story doesn't end there. The two sisters guide Jesus to Lazarus' grave, that is actually a cave, with a loud, round, round, large boulder rolled up in front of it. Roll away the stone, Jesus ordered. They do. Lazarus, come out, Jesus' next orders. He does. Lazarus walks out. End of story. Jesus' life had the last word, roll away the stone. Now this story doesn't become the norm, literally. The followers of Jesus do not set into motion a wave of resuscitations, bodily resurrections. But by showcasing his ability to raise Lazarus in that moment, Jesus does demonstrate that in all of our moments, our death encounters, Jesus does have the final word. Resurrection has the final word. And that which we are wrestling with, struggling with, suffering right now, will lead to that final word. Those words... Roll away the stone. Roll away the stone. Roll away the stone. That became the final word after Jesus' own death. No, he didn't get a free pass, an exemption to have to avoid, to be able to suffer anything. He had to go through it all, all the pains of death. But he does get to have that final word. From inside that tomb, he shouted out to the angels, roll away the stone. And indeed they did. So friends, here we are, cornered by the power of death in such a way as we've never seen before. It has cornered us. But the power of death has also been cornered by Jesus' victorious resurrection. It is a force of power greater than death itself. In telling this story about Lazarus and his sister, I skipped over a brief exchange of words between Jesus and Martha. That is, when she met him on her way, racing out to the edge of town. Martha scolded him for his absence, that's right. But he responds, your brother shall rise again. Oh, I know he will, she said. He will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She says to him, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe. Friend, as you sit here with me, 
I want to ask you the same question. Do you believe this? If not before, will you begin to believe this now? This will work for you. Pray with me, oh God. Help us to hear this word that encounters the hardest and the most difficult circumstances we've ever found ourselves in, collectively at least. Help us to hear this word that is the word of hope, the word of promise, the word of assurance that while death does happen, that you weep with us and that in fact you bring the last word to us, the word of life, the word of the stone being rolled away. Lord, we believe but we also have some unbelief, a whole little bit or maybe a whole lot. Help our unbelief and help us to take hold of your hand. We don't need to socially distance from you, God. We can take your hand with confidence, knowing that your life is flowing into our hands, into our bones, into our blood. Help us to believe, Lord. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you to say words of affirmation that are what you can say in confidence as are printed and shown on your screen. When we are all despairing, when the world is full of grief, when we see no way ahead and hope has gone away, roll the stone away. Although we fear change, although we're not ready, although we'd rather weep and run away, Roll the stone away because we're coming with the women, because we hope where hope is vain, because we call, you call us from the grave and show the way. Roll the stone away. Sisters and brothers, children and elders, believers and doubters, devout and disinterested, strong and weak, roll the stone away. Let us roll the stone away. We are rolling the stone away. Amen. Friends, on this Easter, following the word of God and then publicly declaring our faith, God calls us to respond. This response looks different for all the people of God. Maybe some of you are called to continue to give so that the ministry here at First Presbyterian can continue in our community. There are two ways that you can give. The very first being you can give online or through text. You can see that on the screen right now. Another option is for you to give through mailing your offerings to the church. Those are still being collected and recorded. However God calls you to give, we give you thanks for that because it truly allows us to continue the good works of God here on earth. Some of you also during this time are called to respond by exchanging peace with those who are with you right now and your loved ones who you are not currently with. Maybe right now you are called to respond by sending the Easter message that Christ is risen to your loved ones or possibly to someone who you think needs that message the most. Christ is risen. Maybe during this time, you need to reflect on something this week. There is an Easter message that you heard in one of our songs or prayers or sermon, and you want that to stick. Write it down somewhere. Make it a message on your heart. Let your Easter message ring true this week. Or maybe during this time, your response is to continue in prayer, lifting up all of your joys and concerns. Maybe here with your church family in the comments or sent to our pastor for pastoral care, Stephen Emick, or maybe just in the silence of your own hearts. God is calling us all to respond in many different ways. All of them are appropriate because God wants to hear you. God wants to be with you. So friends, let us respond in whatever way God calls us to.
on this Easter day, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day of resurrection, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, your Word made flesh, your love sent to live among us, to show us and to model for us your love and your way for us to live. Lord, we give you thanks that your power is greater than all powers in the world, including death, its very self. And we are so grateful that through the gift of Easter and resurrection, you assure us there is nothing in life or in death that could possibly separate us from you and your love for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your unending love. Thank you for the assurance that you are always with us in all the moments and in all the seasons of our lives. And thank you 
that you promise us that you are with us even in this season. Not only Easter, but as we're facing these challenging times within our own lives. Lord, it truly is different this Easter morning. The crowds are not gathered. The brass are not assembled. The band and the organ, the new outfits, the smell of lilies and hyacinths, the sight of tulips and daffodils, they're not here. Oh Lord, perhaps you are teaching us anew the true message of Easter. For it is not to be found in any of those trappings, but is to be found in the empty tomb. The empty tomb that needs nothing more to be said or done. Help us as we move throughout this Easter day to focus on that heart of the message, your very heart, your love for each one of us. God, on this Easter day, not only do we celebrate this gift of resurrection, but we celebrate your presence in the lives of those, especially in our church family, in need of your reassuring presence today. We, we pray for those in the hospital from our family of faith. Continue to be with Audrey Chase. Be with Kim Daniels. Be with Katie Mello. Be with Chris Showalter. Grant them healing and peace. We pray for your continued healing for Ted Parcell and Pam Weiss, who now are home from the hospital. And Lord, we thank you for your servant, Barbara Moyer, who on this Easter day is celebrating in your very presence as she has left her earthly life and gone to live with you for all eternity this past week. Continue to bless her family as they mourn. And we pray also for your healing touch, your comforting presence, to be with Trevor, Steph, and little Trevor Vaughn as they mourn the death of Trevor's grandfather, Trevor Vaughn Jr. Oh God, that's a lot of Trevors, but you know them all and know them individually and love them and we pray that you will continue to sustain them. God, we rejoice that tomorrow marks the 100th birthday of Paul Kraft. Surround him with your love. Help him in some way to find celebration in the midst of his day tomorrow. We pray with thanks for him and for Chris Dunbar as she celebrates her 85th birthday on Tuesday. And for Greg and Jeannie Road, who will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary next Saturday. Lord, continue to surround them with your grace, your love, with health and goodness. And now, Lord, as we move ever further into this day, renew our commitment to be your Easter people, following the risen and reigning Lord in all that we say and in all that we do, even as we pray those words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
is risen. He is risen. That very power that crushed the enemy is living in you and in me. Friends, go into this Easter day with a confidence and assurance that the hope of the resurrection is the sustaining hope for you and for all you love. Live into it. Hold on to it. And know that it transforms everything. Trust in Jesus. Trust in God. And be assured that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit will be continuing with you today and always and forever. Amen and amen.